Dr. Ford addresses SDA issues, the John, John Ankerberg Show, 1982. Some history, repercussions. Dr. Ford addressed the Ankerberg, Ankerberg Show in 1982. Please see this video. This was two years after Ford's presentation at Glacier View and what was in reality a theological seismic rupture. Now, after 42 years, the dust has settled, or has it? Most key players and those involved in ministry of that era are now gone to their graves. Very interesting to review the substantial theological arguments and to consider why the issues Dr. Ford raised, problems in Daniel, was too difficult to resolve for the scholars and theologians of the church, otherwise known as the Sanctuary Review Committee. But worse, from a theological perspective, the fact is very little progress in Laodicea has been made solving the problems in Daniel. And yes, that includes the concerned folk in the separated movement who frankly know little about the sanctuary service, let alone the problems of Daniel 8, 14 unto 2300 days, cleansing of the sanctuary. In other words, everyone went back to sleep as is stated in Matthew 25. While it's true the investigative judgment, IJ, is flawed and makes no sense, yet of itself it doesn't prove or disprove Daniel 8.14 and 18.44. The IJ is a theological misnomer that prepares no one for the testimony of Jesus, the three angels' messages, throughout the three woes of Revelation, and certainly doesn't prepare anyone for a testimony of he who made about Christ as Alpha and Omega under the first angel, or the oppressive law, the seven Noahide laws, let alone realizing what the cleansing of guile entails on the Day of Atonement from the Bible. There is no question Dr. Ford was brought to the fore to initiate real Bible study, especially over thorny issues the church could not answer when challenged by the evangelicals with immunity. Ford's 900-page paper for Glacier was an endeavor to get all to return to the Bible, the Bible alone. But why 1980? Looming over the conference at Glacier View was the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy in Luke 21 24. That same year, the church was alerted to Luke 21 in their worldwide Sabbath school, second quarter, via Dr. Gene Zerker, Christ of the Revelation. But even for Ford, and this publication's founding editor were sustaining Millerite 508, 538, 1798 error. Anyone can check the error is real because last of the three uprooted kings of Daniel 7, 8 was in 553. See the link here. It is impossible for 538 AD because Daniel 8.14 has nothing to be sustained by the Millerite conclusion of 538 AD. Best check the history of why 554 chronologically conforms, conforms the proof, evidence for until when of Daniel 8.14 and 1844. The other side argument about the sanctuary doctrine was the attack on the 2300 evenings and mornings to be interpreted as literal days, whether it's 1150 or 2300 days, and Ford so concluded 
and configured, it was Antiochus Epiphanes. Again, there is flaws in this reasoning because Antiochus failed both the 1150 and 2300 literal day dictum. But the theological fallout, as many know, was quite remarkable. The discarding of the 70 weeks of Daniel 924, the accuracy of the 2300 year prophecy until 1844 is the accuracy of until when of Daniel 8, 13 to 14 came into question and the incongruity of the IJ was specially targeted. So what was really at stake? What was at stake was Hebrews 9.23, since to many the sanctuary doctrine had no validity from the New Testament. Until when? Unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. In fact, does equals Hebrews 9.23, which says it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Character perfection. This is the sneaky issue and very touchy subject Ford spoke about on the Anchorbrook show, and this issue has long lingered. It has splintered the camp in many ways, even to this day, and the issue is character perfection or perfectionism. Terminology that brings emotional biases and even vitriol. For those unfamiliar with their Bible, Listen to Paul's letter to the Philippians to regain a biblical foothold. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. This counsel from Paul is the walk with God from the decision to press on, because repentance has softened the heart, and Paul is not denying sanctification because Jesus defines sanctification in John 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall be, believe on me through their word. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Character perfection holds the misconception that God will only return when his people have attained character perfection, which is from all their faults and sins, and Ford made that point clearly. It led to legalism. Many lost sight of the joy of the gospel of salvation when all along perfectionism goads the self-righteous minded, making it a subtle works orientation, leaving many bewildered. Many departed on this subject alone. They say, I'm not good enough, unable to measure up. Surely you've heard that, right? 
whereas John 17 states truth is the cleansing process in its specific relation to sanctify, set apart, truth. The only conclusion is the sanctification removes guile from one's mouth, which is what must be cleansed. Revelation 14, 1 to 5. Sanctify them, sanctify them through thy truth equals no guile. More on this later. Job's experience, he had the most perfect character, but it caused the wife to snarl and say, curse God and die. Job 2.9 Job eventually recognized the issue, deeply repented only when he saw the grandeur of God and eternal identity of the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Yeah, so being bowed down with guilt worried or wondering whether they make it to heaven because of the emphasis of character perfection. It is what Dr. Ford says in the interview, that's true 100%. This leaves one thing, no joy, the matter of salvation. He rightly presents the assurance of salvation by faith. Even recently, while responding about the question of diet and its apparent relation to character perfection, well, Romans 14 quelled all worry since Paul knew how these things led to hang-ups and how it brings about the world of antagonism, legalism, the lament, unworthy, worthy, unworthy. That's the lament of the legalist, and they then diminish the cross in one's life and focus on self-righteousness even when they accepted the free gift of salvation. At least Dr. Ford presented solid biblical evidence that justification and salvation is good news by faith, not by works. Listen to the Ankerberg, Ankerberg interview. Conclusion, character perfection is very subjective, yields deep prejudices with the striving and the adamant are very hard to cajole or otherwise. Ask Job's friends, right? Result? It stifles Bible study. It seems as far back as 1980, Dr. Ford was illustrating that justification by faith was very simple and joyful. But righteousness by faith has been drowning in the murky waters of theologians, and many vindicate this by saying, Justific justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity. Here's the link here. The murky waters and the confusion of imputed righteousness and has inundated Laodicea, and nothing changes. While many pastors and elders abandoned Laodicea over the sanctuary doctrine, and so Ford is blamed. The common view of those who left needs who left needs is placed in character perfection due to the fallen nature, and were resolved to confirm the reform reformation it's faith alone and that's the good news and yes they left some walked into sunday evangelical churches the day of atonement and the first angel's warning it's been a long time since the dr ford issue 1980 and his concerns in addressing the problems in daniel and the sanctuary doctrine but when you really look at the problems with daniel 8, 14 it's really a shallow debate because missing in all the disparagement is the compelling evidence of the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world and eternal righteousness by faith in the setting of Revelation chapter 13. The fundamental principle of the first angel's warning brings forth the more glorious details of 2 Corinthians 3 and eternal righteousness by faith. Because that entails Christ's eternal identity as Alpha, solely re relevant to his divine status as the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. That's Revelation 13.8. And of his ministry 
after the order of Melchizedek. Psalms 110, 1 to 4, and John 1. These facts bring to the fore the first angel's warning, and the real issue, which is the Godhead doctrine. Yes, it is and will be the loud cry. But ask yourself, why did Laodicea accept the triune trinity? The same year, Dr. Ford set out to resolve the problems in Daniel. A sacrosanct tenet of uniqueness of Adventist theology at Glacier View. That's one thing. But like all in Laodicea, are you aware Dr. Ford adhered strongly to the Trinity teaching? And also the Millerite 508-1798 error. Let that sink in before you read on. But again, it's time to pay attention. The Trinity, the Arian Doctrine of 88, are the one and the same. The one God doctrine, but very few recognize what it does to the first angel's warning. It renders the first angel's message void. Especially in context of Ezekiel 9 and the sealing time of Revelation 7. Cleansing the Sanctuary. Dr. Ford emphasizes with Ankerberg, Hebrews 9.23, is the only place in New Testament that the cleansing of the heavenly in the second apartment and therefore was generic to the, to the removal of the stain of sin. Here is the problem. Dr. Ford doesn't bring the necessary purpose of the cleansing where sin began the heavenly temple, and the cleansing directed at corporate sin, and then to the individual. So when Paul said it was necessary for the heavenly to be cleansed, it's as per the type of Leviticus 16. Didn't sin begin in heaven? This misconstruction about the generic removal of sin was totally blindsided by the investigative judgment that leaned to a significant problem which is by the time you reach the sanctuary theology of the third temple and the second Thessalonians two guy, you have a predicament. More on this later. There is no question. Dr. Ford was raised by God at a critical juncture in Laodicea because Luke 21, 24 was fulfilled that year. Church that year, hallowed the Trinity and God, the eternal son, heresy as gospel. The tragedy. Within three weeks, the assembled delegates agreed to the process of defrocking and ultimately terminating that saw the departure of Dr. Ford. The heretic, they said, under their breasts. Ever since, many voices since were lampooning Dr. Ford for the denial of the sanctuary doctrine. Rightly so, yes. But what did the voices rely upon? All the traditions of the elders, the writings, and a superficial appreciation of the sanctuary doctrine. But why did the voices of Glacier agree to the Roman Catholic creedal dogma of the Trinity and God the Eternal Son? That's gross heresy. No one saw it and still don't. Are you paying attention yet? Here's the paradox. Dr. Ford, an avowed believer in the Catholic Trinity teaching, as well as the Millerite era of 508, 538, and 1798, but also, says the good news, the everlasting gospel. It must be said the good news of the gospel is true, and the everlasting gospel in its separate context are two different things. Eternal righteous by faith. Like, who has considered eternal righteousness in its entire context of the everlasting gospel? 
or its meaning with the three woes of Revelation, let alone its colossal importance of Revelation 13, 8 and the two, and the two beasts. But to say the atonement is completed at the cross is to nullify the ministry of Christ as great high priest and the sanctuary doctrine, which is one thing, but more importantly, to be avowed of the creedal trinity or the Arian emanated view, both mean the same thing, one God, that means the first angel's warning is now the greatest concern. Why? Because to shrug the shoulders and insist the first angel's warning is only about the Sabbath is to miss the entire point of eternal righteousness by faith of Revelation 13.8. And here's the big problem. You retain uncleansed guile in your mouth, contrary to Revelation 14.5. There is an absolute need for understanding the ministry of Christ after the order of Melchizedek in the sealing of Revelation 7. More later. And who was Melchizedek? None other than Paul confirmed Melchizedek of his eternal identity. Hebrews 7, 1-3. Confirming Christ, Alpha and Omega, the eternal Logos. John 1. Meaning... The Trinitarian or Arian formulation of God are gross errors and contrary to John 1 and the first angel's warning. This fact turns everything on its head in respect to righteousness. Laodicea has sustained the unrighteousness of the creed since 1980, and the 27 fundamental beliefs, numbers 2 and 4, issued in 1980, are the landmark, and it all demands an answer. Whether you believe it or not, adding to the meaning of the first angel's warning, the one God belief of the Trinity, or Arian, places a large problem with Revelation 14 because we all need to reread Revelation 22, 18 to 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Is that, is it that serious? People don't realize Dr. Ford's conclusions, whether right or wrong, was returned to the Bible alone. And in summary, when one looks now at the 1982 Anchorberg show that features the denial of Daniel 8.14 due to the investigative judgment featuring Laodicea, a fracturing Laodicea, but hey, are you listening? All the talk since provided no insight to the real issues of the first angel's warning. As assumed then and now is always the National Sunday Law. But the problem there, of course, is the events of Revelation 17, 16 to 18. Eliminates any possibility of a National Sunday Law to even exist. So Lucifer had a field day at the time of 1980 and onwards. In many respects, it triggered shaking in Laodicea. But one academic said Dr. Ford was challenging all academia and laity in Laodicea back to the Bible, and this caused a big stink in all the world conferences of Laodicea. And there has been no healing regardless of what anyone says. Problems of Daniel still exist. While Ford's views on the Trinity, the atonement completed at the cross, and affirmed the 508 and 1798 error, there is no question, had the Trinity been realized as an anathema with the first angel, it would also ensure that the dates of 508, 38, and 90, 1798, had they been studied, would have found the three uprooted Ostrogoth kings ended in 553, 
not 538 basic stuff. So what would have occurred? Much light from heaven was intended to be eventuated at Glacier View in 1980. The church defrocked Dr. Ford. They settled with the creedal doctrine of God and the 27 fundamental beliefs and enshrined the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Godhead that included the Neoplatonist doctrine of the eternal Son. God intended much light for the convention at Glacier, but madness ensued on many fronts. What Ford proved to the time of the 1970s into 1990s meant one thing. A lack of serious Bible study existed. The hangover from the golden days of Laodicea, Laodicean ministry. It is a fact, questioning the book of Daniel, problems in Daniel, has seriously affected people from the highest echelons to the lowest to this day. Dr. Ford and a few others knew that being fully immersed in the Red Books, the church could not defend their beliefs with the resurgent evangelical community of not only plagiarism of E.G. White, but the Sanctuary Doctrine. Hence, Ankerberg show in 1982. Besides, the ignominy of the cult mentality had to be addressed. The shaking commenced. Many departed. See Jeffrey Paxton's observations here in this link. To a large extent, this shaking was monopolized by the separated movement, especially in the 1990s. Standishes, they all carried doctrinal baggage and defending the prophet and these voices could never articulate the unfinished ministry of the Day of Atonement. And then there was character perfection, while others knew the IJ was incorrect. Not to mention the craftiness of the Arian doctrine of 88 as well, the root problem of 88. In other words, what a mess. And on it went with concepts of conceptual Adjustments like the pre-advent judgment, investigation of the books, but who were bothered to see check out means to have one's name retained in the Lamb's Book of Life, Revelation 13.8. The question is whether the pre-advent judgment should be the pre-advent sealing, which is what Revelation 7 is all about, the sealing time. Right? Sanctification and truth, the seal of God, the truth pure and unadulterated, as it is in he who made. John seventeen seventeen. No doubt. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Pre Advent sealing. Well, a pre Advent sealing is certain because those whose names remain in the Lamb's Book of Life means the individual made a decision to walk in faith by grace, and he who made, retained their names in the Lamb's Book of Life, and thereby sealed. Their testimony is of Christ and his eternal identity. Revelation 13a, and not the Trinity or Arian formulation. They walk by faith with the full assurance of salvation. Then there is the awareness of Revelation 22.11. In the sealing time that includes a multitude and the 144,000. It's quite a remarkable experience to watch this Dr. Ford video from 1982, especially with the light of eternal righteousness by faith in the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, and to respond with the Bible alone. It is a fact Dr. Ford was correct about the misuse of E.G. White and the IJ, and forthrightly defended her work. It's in the interview. At 47 minutes 25 in the video, the admission is there is no basis for 1844 as a date. While completely untrue, the problem is this, the matter of Daniel 814 will be, will not be, the central dispute with the eighth king. 
Why? The first angel and the false Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4 is the issue. That will be an eyebrow raiser for those not following discussions in these links. The fact is, Daniel 8.14 the, establishes the evidence of a heavenly cleansing. There in Hebrews 9.23. But it needs to be realized that is not the theological sword fight at the time of the two witnesses, let alone the time of the plus 30 days when the mark of the beast and the worship the, of the image is emphasized, let alone the blessings to those who wait for the thir 1335. Why? Because the corporate, from the holy to the court, is a different concept to consider. This point is respect in respect to Revelation 11, will be explained. At 54 minutes, Lewis Bolton book, Omega, gets a mention. How ironic the concept of the Alpha and Omega of deadly heresies was never solved at Glacier. But is solved via the insights of eternal righteousness by faith in the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world from Revelation 13.8. The other problem about the Alpha is the Aryan belief by Wagner and Jones was never rebuked by E.G. White, let alone the Trian Trinity. Why is that? At 59 minutes, again, the Trinity is assumed to be truth. At one hour that Jesus lived a sinless life, but they were then disputing with the idea Jesus never had a sinful nature, whereas Paul said, likewise of the sinful flesh, Romans 8, 3, and Jesus partook the slave form of humanity at the Incarnation, in Philippians 2. Conclusion, Dr. Ford was a gifted scholar, an honest individual, and was used by he who made to return all to the Bible alone. He is wrong on such points as the type not matter, mattering. It does, since Jesus died on Passover. The whole matter of whether Christ went before the Father, or ministered the corporate, is another matter. Why? Because both involve two different ministrations. The first being that he did have to go before the Father in the form of the wave sheaf presentation, which marked the fulfillment of the latter part of the first fruits after the resurrection, which equals the presentation which also included those who were resurrected and walked around Jerusalem and later were taken up as trophies in reference to the wave sheaf. As far as the anti-typical Day of Atonement, it didn't happen in 31 AD after the resurrection because it's a fall feast. 1844 is not the only chronological prophecy since there are the 1260-1290 in the form of 554 plus 1260 and 554 plus 1290 equals 1844. And later in literal time, which equals Ford's apotelismatic principle, he applied at Glacier. 1844 to 1980, though not chronological, but as prophetic events had to be a reality. Since the 12 and 3 p.m. concurrent call, as well as the arrival of the 5 p.m. workers, which is now a reality, and just on time with Luke 21:24. Luke 21:24 equals judgment begins with the house of God. That's Laodicea. That's spewing. Revelation 3 and Ezekiel 9, the final atonement at the altar in the court. See these links. Whether Christ went before the Father after the resurrection and after the Sabbath, this was the Feast of First Fruits. Did I say whether? I said when. When Christ went before the Father after the resurrection and after the Sabbath, this was the Feast of First Fruits. 
the antitype, when Jesus brought the first fruits of the harvest before the Father. Afterwards was Pentecost. The people could not eat prior to this presentation. After the presentation in heaven, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Hebrews 9.12 Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place thus securing an eternal redemption for us. Whereas Hebrews' entrance into the Hagia sanctuary or holy place involved the second agenda of the sanctuary, and this is what we see in reference to the corporate issue of the seven churches, as well as the use of Tahagia in Hebrews 9.12. It will come as a, pri as a surprise but when one reviews the third temple theology of the guy in 2 Thessalonians 2 and Revelation 13, is that 1844, Daniel 814, will have little, if any, bearing on the final events, which are the apotelismatic of Matthew 2415, the abomination of desolation. And that being said, the shut door is not far behind, because the fact is that the trumpets now herald the end of the Day of Atonement. See these links. Seventy weeks remains a problem. As far as the seven weeks or 49 years with regard to building walls not being mentioned in Ezra is irrelevant to a certain degree because it's already mentioned within the chronology and it would have to be a reality since scripture states it. As far as 34 AD is concerned, the accusation is that there is no proof that this was the correct year. Acts 8 clearly reveals the corporate spewing, so both of those facts are in order, and to be true to his word, he who made just requires that you do the math and calculate from 34 AD back in time or any other assumed date. The decree of Cyrus or the 20th year of Artaxerxes don't work. So counting back from, let's say, 37 AD or 30 AD won't align with Artaxerxes' 7th year decree of 457 BC. Whereas going forward from 457 will give us results. The three chronological segments are to be used successively in order to determine an exact amount of time, which equals 14 490 years. It's very likely that principalities and powers that be will mess around with the final seven years and will not be interested in explaining the seven weeks and 62 weeks. The only way that they can get away with such deception is reinterpreting the prophecy, making it seem like 70 weeks in literal time and timing the events such as the building of the walls in order to align with the literal period of time seven weeks, and then 62 weeks, more in literal time, and then the appearance of Benny Ephraim, who will die in the midst of the week, and then three and a half years in reference to what takes place after the healing of the fatal wound. 70 weeks in literal time equals 16.1 months. But in accordance with the deception, they can say, just like Tovia, that the other periods of time were already fulfilled and that Jerusalem city was destroyed, as predicted. But the final period of seven years involves the redemption of Japhet. Time for some speculation. It can actually be stated that within the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, Daniel 8, 14, starting in 1844, there is a triple ministration of the high priest which follows this order. 1844, 1888, 1980 equals most holy place. Holy place. Individual. Then there is the matter of being taken over the ground again regarding 1888 and its failure. Then contemporary events from 1896 to 1980. Third segment of Revelation 14, 6, 7, 8. Nine. The second round of the Antitypical Day of Atonement equals the Holy Place, involves 
the rise of the 5 p.m. group. First Angel, 1980 Statement Worship, Him That Created. The Warning, Message Repeated, Given to the Church. 3 p.m., Given by the 5 p.m. Second Angel, Babylon Has Fallen, A Literal Event in the Mediterranean Sea. Exit All That Is Babylon. Revelation 18. Third angel, the rise of Benny David, the third angel's message in its complete final setting because the Day of Atonement closes deep within the third woe. Conclusion. The parabolic scope of the Day of Atonement commencing in 1844 encapsulates the time frame of the 12 to 3 to 5 p.m. workers leading to 6 p.m. No more workers, and then midnight, the parable of the ten virgins. Funny how the ten men in Zechariah 8.23 went to the vendors at the third temple. Perhaps five of those virgins are included in this alliance from a theological perspective, yet not the five prudent ones. Matthew 25. What did the vendors sell? Unity consciousness and Benny David. That's Antichrist, Lucifer, and Angel of Light. To be continued.